have almost no memories of the last leg of my journey from the Bay Area to Seattle. The landscape was a blur, my mind preoccupied with visions of home. I kept trying to imagine how my family was doing, what kind of closed community had developed in Seattle. An elite enclave like Lake City, or something else altogether? Only thing of consequence I remember happened around Eureka, where the terrain got real precarious. A cartel transport had gotten stuck in a safe You really saved my ass, mister. His name was Doug Heideland. He was delivering ethanol to Portland and offered me a ride north that would cut my travel time in half. He said the cartel had lost so many supplies to attacks, they were thinking of closing their northwest route. The transports were most vulnerable during dead time, that five minute period after the EMP until it's safe to start your vehicle. So, you know who sat right there in that very seat? Bill Walker. It's true. He rode to Colorado Springs from Vegas, where I heard he killed ten men with his bare hands. That's so. What have you heard about Seattle? Seattle? Is that where you're going? It was terrible what happened to Doug. But at least his death wasn't in vain. Passing through Portland, I posted his story on the word wall. Heard it drove the cartel to finally close the Northwest route, probably saving dozens of lives in the process. One thing still haunted me about Doug, though. The way he reacted to my question about Seattle. It wasn't till I reached the new gates of the city that I understood why. Of all the ways I had envisioned Seattle developing, this was definitely not one of them. Seattle used to be called the Emerald City, crown jewel of the Northwest. In the two years since I'd been gone, the city had, well, lost its luster. But those walls and warning signs only increased my determination. tell you how bizarre it felt to be a fugitive in your own city. Thought I had a big advantage over other strangers, because I knew those streets like the back of my hand. But so many of the old landmarks were gone, burned down, or blown up. Seattle had been destroyed once before, in 1889, and the city was rebuilt right over the ruins. Keep moving, or I'll shoot. Turned out, I wasn't the only fugitive. George was a former fisherman who'd moved underground with a makeshift family of orphans. Told George that I had no intention of stealing his stuff, that I was just trying to get home to Queen Anne. You'll never make it that far. Just walked all the way from New York. Think I can handle a few more miles. Last miles you'll walk as a free man. George told me Seattle had fallen under martial law about a year ago. After a marauder attack, a couple local leaders rallied survivors to take back the city. It all started with good intentions, but in their quest to enclose the city, the leaders formed mandatory labor laws that, over time, became no different than a prison. Better safe than sorry. That's their motto. Better dead than a slave. That's mine. I got a sinking feeling about Janelle and Kizzy. If they had survived, what had life been like for them? It was hard to believe the universe had given me a gun just to kill a couple security guards. But even though Seattle had changed so radically, the real question was, had I? Was I finally ready to kill just to get home? Once again, death had backed me into a corner. This time, though, I had a weapon. 
and the resolve to use it. But simply pulling the trigger and shooting someone is not always the best use of a gun. Down in those dark tunnels, I quickly calculated my chances of hitting two moving targets were significantly less than hitting one stationary target. Once I lost the guards and reoriented myself up on the streets, I realized I was only a block from my office, the place where all this had started. Going back there felt surreal, like a dream of some past life. Ever since San Rafael, I'd been fixated on the name Adina. Just had this sense it was more than the Indians who built the Serpent Mound more than the biotech corporation that built nanites for Parthia. And then it hit me. Adina was a name buried in my client files. When I started my own agency, our first big ad campaign was for Micromed, a struggling medical engineering lab in Spokane. I put together a series of print and TV ads touting their pioneering research in smart plasma. Didn't solve their financial problems, but it did land them a lucrative buyout by another company, Adina Biotech. Adina, as it turned out, was primarily interested in one of Micromed's nanotech patents, a programmable genetic marker. It was impossible to comprehend my connection to the whole conspiracy. Yet one thing was painfully clear. I sold technology to the world, and in my own way, I helped cause the fall. It's hard sometimes not to second-guess yourself. You wonder how things might have turned out if your priorities and your choices had been different. It wasn't so long ago I stood there and looked out my office window trying to see the future, the necessary steps that would lead me to success. But almost two years later, I looked out that same window, yearning to see the past, to retrace the steps that had led me so far away from the only thing that truly matters, family. As much as I wanted to get home, Part of me dreaded what I'd find there. Took every ounce of hope I had to get back on the road to Queen Anne. Actually, it wasn't a road at all. It was a tidal dam on Lake Union, built by the enslaved citizens of Seattle. Tidal energy, that's what they used to power their electric fence. And with most of the city's guards stationed at the perimeter gates, crossing the dam was actually the safest and shortest route home. Walking into my old neighborhood, I barely recognized anything. And that got me thinking, would my family still recognize me? Broke into a house about a block from mine, gave me a chance to clean up and settle down. My mind was all over the place. What would I say to my wife and daughter if they'd survived? How would I explain why my trip took me so damn long? And what would I say if only one of them survived? Words had always come so easily to me before, but five minutes from home, I was at an absolute loss. As I walked through the field that used to be my driveway, I remember wondering if I'd just deluded myself into believing my wife and daughter could still be alive. I was a salesman after all. Had I sold myself false hope just to take my mind off the awful reality? The truth was in there. Everything I'd walked for, killed for, almost died for. And ready or not, it was time for me to finally face that truth. Janelle? 
Kizzy? Anybody home? After fantasizing for so long about that moment, about walking back through my own front door, I have to say, it wasn't at all what I expected. What I did expect, though, was to feel some kind of relief, comfort even, that I'd finally made it home. But I felt nothing. I was numb. It was as if I'd completely detached myself from my body. But then I saw something. Someone had gotten into our emergency supplies. We kept the container hidden in the basement. Almost no chance anyone would ever find it unless they knew exactly where to look. Jay? Kiz? If one or both of them made it, I figured there might be signs of them up in the bedrooms. Stepping into Kizzy's room, my heart started racing. Her suitcase was gone, and all her favorite shoes. I knew right then and there my daughter had survived. But was she still alive? Just like with Kizzy's room, the moment I walked into our bedroom, I knew what had happened to my wife. I'd seen all the signs hundreds of times before. The multi bed the depression in the pillow. As I started to envision Janelle's last night alive, I noticed she'd been working on something. My dearest Russ, it's time to take that honeymoon we never had before your business really takes off and I go back to work. And believe it or not, your parents have offered to come and stay with Kizzy. So no excuses this time, only promises. Love you madly, Jay. God, I wanted so bad to give her everything. What was I thinking? Is that you, honey? Gwen? What the hell are you doing here? Kizzy's alive, Russell. I saved her two weeks ago from the Seattle labor camp. What? Where is she? Where is she, goddammit? They have her. Parthia. I just assumed Gwen worked for the New World historians. But the truth was... She was only the intermediary between them and Parthia. I know what you think, Russell, but it was all a terrible accident, I swear to you. I don't give a damn anymore about why all this happened. I just want my daughter back. Kill me and you'll never see her again. I want to talk to Hastings. Where is he? Where's Parthia? They're watching us right now. Didn't think he'd make it this far. 